morning I took off from Chehalis, Washington, en route to Yakima, and of course every time that any of us fly over the country near Mount Rainier, we spend an hour or two in search of the marine plane that's never been found that they believe is in the snow someplace southwest of that particular area. That area is located at about, or <coughs> its elevation is about 10,000 foot, and I had made one sweep in close to Mount Rainier and down one of the canyons and was dragging it for any types of objects that might prove to be the marine ship. Uh, and as I come out uh, of the canyon there, it was about 15 minutes. I was approximately 25 to 28 miles from Mount Rainier. I climbed back up to 9,200 feet, and I noticed to the left of me a chain which looked to me like the tail of a Chinese kite, uh, kind of weaving and going at a terrific speed across the face of Mount Rainier. I, uh, at first, uh, thought they were geese because it flew like geese, but it was going so fast that, that uh, I immediately changed my mind and decided it was a bunch of new jet planes in formation. Well, as the, as the planes come to the edge of Mount Rainier, flying at about 160 degrees south, uh, I uh, thought I would clock them because it was such a clear day and uh, I didn't know where their destination was, but uh, due to the fact that I had Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams to clock them by, I just thought I'd see just how fast they were going, since among pilots we argue about speed so much. And uh, uh, they seemed to flip and flash in the sun just like a mirror. And uh, in fact, I happened to be at an angle from the sun that seemed to hit the tops of these uh, peculiar looking things in such a way that it, it almost blinded you when you when you looked at, at them through your plexiglass windshield. Well, uh, I uh, it was about one minute to three when uh, I, st I started clocking them on my uh, my sweep secondhand clock, and uh, as I kept looking at them, I kept looking for their tails. They didn't have any tails. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe I something's wrong with my eyes. And, I turns the, the plane around and opens the window and looks out the window and sure enough I couldn't find any tails on them. And uh, the whole observation of these particular ships didn't last more than about two and a half minutes. And I could see them only plainly when uh, they seemed to tip their wing or whatever it was and the sun flashed on them. They looked something like a, a pie plate that was cut in half with a sort of a convex triangle in the rear. Now, I thought, well, uh, that maybe they're jet planes with just the, pa the tail painted green or brown or something, and didn't think too, too much of it, but kept on watching them. Uh, they didn't fly in the conventional formation that's taught in our Army. They, uh, they seemed to kind of weave in and out right above the mountaintop. And uh, I would say that they even went down into the canyons in several instances, oh, probably 100 feet. But I could see them against uh, the snow, of course, on Mount Rainier, and against the snow on Mount Adams as they were flashing, and uh, against a high ridge that happens to lay in between Mount Rainier and Mount Adams. But uh, when I observed the tail end of the last one passing Mount Adams, and I was at an angle, uh, near Mount Rainier from it, but uh, I looked at my watch and it showed one minute and 42 seconds. Well, uh, I still thought, well, that's pretty fast, and I didn't stop to think what the distance was between the two mountains. Well, I landed at Yakima, Washington, and uh, Al Baxter was there to greet me, and uh, <laughs> he told me, I guess I better change my brand. <laughs> Uh, but he, he kind of gave me a mysterious sort of a look that maybe I had seen something. He didn't know. Right here, we've seen something. I've seen something. Hundreds of pilots have seen something in the skies. We have doodle, uh, dutifully reported these things. And we have to have 15 million witnesses before anybody's going to look into the problem seriously. Why, this is utterly fantastic. This is more fantastic than than flying saucers or, or people from Venus or anything, as far as I'm concerned.
Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile, found sometime last week, has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Late this afternoon, a bulletin from New Mexico suggested that the widely publicized mystery of the flying saucers may soon be solved. Army Air Force officers reported that one of the strange disks had been found and inspected sometime last week. Our correspondents in Los Angeles and Chicago have been in contact with Army officials endeavoring to obtain all possible late information. Joe Wilson reports to us now from Chicago. The Army may be getting to the bottom of all this talk about the so-called flying saucers. As a matter of fact, the 509th Atomic Bomb Group headquarters at Roswell, New Mexico, reports that it has received one of the disks which landed on a ranch outside Roswell. The disk landed at a ranch at Corona, New Mexico, and the rancher turned it over to the Air Force. Rancher W.W. W. Brizel was the man who discovered the saucer. Colonel William Blanchard of the Roswell Air Base refuses to give details of what the flying disk looks like. In Fort Worth, Texas, where the object was first sent, Brigadier General Roger Ramey says that it is being shipped by air to the AAF Research Center at Wright Field, Ohio. A few moments ago, I talked to officials at Wright Field, and they declared that they expect the so-called flying chopper to be delivered there, but that it hasn't arrived as yet. In the meantime, General Ramey describes the object as being of flimsy construction, almost like a box type. He says that it was so battered that he was unable to determine whether it had a disc form, and he does not indicate its size. Ramey says that so far as can be determined, no one saw the object in the air, and he describes it as being made of some sort of tinfoil. Other Army officials say that further information indicates that the object had a diameter of about 20 to 25 feet, and that nothing in the apparent construction indicated any capacity for speed, and that there was no evidence of a power plant. The disc also appeared too flimsy to carry a man. Now, back to Taylor Grant in New York. There was important activity within the U.N. Security Council. I was at a television station in Baton Rouge, Louisiana in 1978. Uh, a reporter was late. The station manager was entertaining me, giving me coffee, a little embarrassed because he knew I had a busy day. I was speaking that evening at Louisiana State University. Out of the blue, he says, uh, gee, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. Who's he? Oh, well, he handled pieces of the wreckage of one of those saucers you're interested in when he was in the military. That got my attention, to say the least. 
lives over in Houma, Louisiana. We're old ham radio buddies. Well, the reporter shows up. Only time in my life I've been really glad somebody was late. And the next day I called Jesse from the airport. He told me a story, but he didn't have an exact date. And it was in evening papers from Chicago West. It gave us names. It gave us places, uh, what you might describe as a, an overview of the story. It kept growing during the day, so different articles said different things. Uh, you know, you had headlines like this. This is the Chicago Daily News. Here's the Spokane Chronicle. Army declares flying disc found. My favorite is this one, which explains the dilemma we're in. Army finds flying saucer. General believes it is radar weather gadget. The cover story was already in late that same day. A seminal event for me in the secret space program began in June of 1947. No, I wasn't around in June of 1947, but historically it was a seminal event. And many of you have heard of the Maury Island affair, a very strange, bizarre uh, incident that took place on the Pacific Northwest of the United States. Shortly after Kenneth Arnold, a pilot, gave us the term flying saucer that month, there was a UFO sighting. In this sighting, UFOs evidently uh, crashed, uh, rained debris down upon some civilians, killed a dog, according to the story, wounded a child, according to the story. And it led to a chain of events that are very, very unusual, and yet are evidence of something that took place 20 years later that shows us there was a deep connection between the UFO story, as it was promulgated back in the 1940s, and s very serious political and military events of the next 20, 30 years. So, Maury Island Affair, there's a UFO sighting shortly after Kenneth Arnold gave us the famous flying saucer story. And a man that we know as Fred Crisman claimed that he, he had been involved in that incident. He claimed that people had been hurt, that he had pieces of the UFO. And what happened was individuals of the United States uh, Army Air Force at the time visited Crisman and his partner, Mr. Dahl, and retrieved pieces of this so-called debris of the UFO. They got on a plane, the plane crashed, and both of these Air Force officers died. These are probably the first two uh, victims, mortalities associated with the UFO phenomenon. The first two, there were many more since then, as any student of UFO history knows. So Fred Crisman is this strange guy 
you know, a strange background. No one knows too much about him. He seems to have been some kind of confidence man, some kind of criminal, a crook, but maybe also an intelligence agent. There is evidence that there were uh, intelligence connections to his background. He was also somebody I like to call a wandering bishop, and I'll get to that story in a minute, because this is a striking aspect of this whole field that people have not covered because they don't understand it. Fred Crisman, 1947, seminal event in UFO history. He shows up again 20 years later, being investigated by a district attorney, Jim Garrison, in New Orleans, because of his alleged role in the Kennedy assassination. We'll come back to that in a minute. One of the people investigating the Maury Island affair and all of the UFO incidents that were taking place in the Pacific Northwest in 1947, in the months before and after the famous Roswell crash, was this man, FBI special agent in charge, stationed in Butte, Montana. He was in charge of a bunch of files we call the SM-X files, according to the FBI's own documentation. UFO matters were classified as SM-X, security matter-X. These were the original X files. This man's name is Guy Bannister. Guy Bannister is a man who will come up again in our discussion 20 years later as a suspect in the Kennedy assassination. 